training, talent development, performance, fitness, health, longevity, supplements, everything you need to transform from athlete to super athlete. Welcome to Super Athlete Radio. And Dr. Jonathan Fields. Jonathan, how are you doing today? Hey, Chase. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. I'm really excited. You have a very unique background that I think I'm really excited to learn more about, and I'm sure our audience is as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you start? Let's just start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? And- sure, absolutely. I was actually born on a sheep farm in northern Israel in the Galil in 79. Hmm. And I lived there until I was about seven years old, living the, uh, the very outdoor life, you know, barefooted, snakes and scorpions, that whole nine. And we moved over here when I was about seven years old to the U.S., the South Florida area. And I've been here ever since. And as, as a kid, I got into martial arts. I think I started with uh, Taekwondo and then karate. And then later in my 20s, I met a guy by the name of um, Phoenix Legrand and started with Lost Legacy Systems in a mixed martial arts kind of format. It was traditional, but it was a bunch of different arts kind of tied in together. And around the same time, I met my um, initial acupuncture teacher, my Qigong master, who kind of got me into the Eastern healing arts. And then what was the biggest shift, whether culturally or environmentally, going from Israel to South Florida? That's a great question. It was, it was a big culture shock for me initially, especially from, from, from farm life, right? So when I moved over here, we had to do things like wear shoes and Not- underwear, <laughs> you know? uh things like that so it, it was a big change i mean i didn't really speak any english at the time either and, and i think that was maybe one of the things that drew me to the martial arts I, I think when i came over you know i was very different uh culturally and otherwise i kind of stuck out like a sore thumb and you know kids try to bully me and we would end up fighting and later on becoming friends i think that's usually you know how it yeah. works but it was um it, w- it was qu- quite a big difference you know i came here to the suburbs and you know, I grew up in a, in a basically a village where we had one shop in the whole town and maybe 100 houses. And it was miles and miles, you know, maybe a 20, 30 minute drive to the nearest city that you can get to. Hmm. And then tell me a little bit about your martial arts experience growing up. Taekwondo. What was that like? Yeah, so I started in Coral Springs under uh, Jeff Krupp and he was a uh, the, one on the Pan American team, I believe. And I actually started around 10 or 11 with the Taekwondo. I had done a little karate before that. And right away, I, I think I was the oldest kid. They, they had to put me in an adult class because I was about 11 at the time. And all the other kids in the class were like eight or nine. So they were too young. And the youngest adults in adults class were about 14, 15 years old. So I was mm-hmm. the youngest kid and I was basically sparring with adults. I mean, we had police officers in the class and uh, the other youngest kids were, were these twins. I think they're like 14, 15, and they were much more advanced. So it, w- it was great for me to be able to kind of um, start in that setting where it was people were taking it more seriously, not just a little kiddie class where they're running around and jumping and playing. And, you know, I, I practiced at home a lot. Um, I, I really fell in love with the arts and then I, uh, I took a break for a little while during high school and in my early twenties, I, I got back into it and started training. Uh, you know, when I met, uh, Phoenix, uh, I thought I was going to train like once a day and I ended up taking a class and at the time I was in the gym, probably five, six days a week. Mm. And I took a class and I could barely keep up with these 13 year olds and 12 year olds that were in the class. And I thought, wow, this is way harder and what I'm doing in the gym, it's way more challenging. And um, my teacher is a, a master personal trainer as well. So the, the physical fitness aspect of it was big. It wasn't just kicking and punching and, and techniques. We would spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, explosive kind of hit type of workouts. And mm. uh, I fell in love with it. And then next thing I knew, I was training six, seven days a week. We actually opened a studio together. We opened a dojo in 2004, 2005 in um, Margate area and until one of the hurricanes uh, caved our roof in and all the students scattered i think it was wilma at the time Mm. and 06 that kind of uh, ruined that for us after that we spent seven years teaching in a rec center in one of the big rec centers in coconut creek and then after that we probably spent another five six years teaching out of some of the biggest mma gyms in the south florida region Uh, most of them have changed ownership or closed now but we worked with a lot of professional fighters I train professional and amateur fighters. I've worked on them as far as the, the acupuncture and the integrative medicine as well. And we got to work very closely, you know, with, with uh, different boxers, wrestlers, jujitsu guys. So it, it was wonderful, wonderful experience. I've been a little bit less active the last three years. I had uh, two kids 
within 16 months and we opened uh, another two clinics in the last couple of years. So as the kids get a little older, I'm hoping to get back into it, you know, full time or at least go back to teaching a few days a week. Now I'm kind of more uh, relegated to teaching like Tai Chi and Qigong classes at retreats mm. and things of that nature. Not as active as I uh, once used to be. And I'm looking forward to getting back into it. And the system that you said that you partnered with him when you were 24, that was what you guys turned Lost Legacy Systems? Correct. So my uh, my teacher, uh, Master Legrand, founded that system and he had been in martial arts. He's probably been in martial arts for close to 50 years uh, since, mm-hmm. he was a, since he was a baby. Both his parents were black belts. His uncles were all black belts. So he grew up in the arts. He had a, a seven or eight different black belts and different styles that he had acquired over the years. And he was a uh, old school, um, like Brooklyn martial artist, moved down here around 2003. And I met him shortly thereafter. He's a uh, Haitian guy. So they grew up with like that real hardcore, like 70s type New York City uh, training that he was mm. able to bring down here and and it just it fit really well for me it was uh pretty intense and it was not like the a lot of the mcdojos that we have running around where you know they're mm. selling belts every you know two months or anything like that it would take years to to get belts sometimes in the system and then did you have any idea of what you wanted to do professionally high school early 20s things like that yeah, another good question. You know, at the time, I, I've kind of, it's it's a mixed bag. You know, the martial arts was a, a huge part of my life, and I was doing that kind of semi-professionally. Art is a big part of my life. I've been drawing and painting since I could hold a crayon. I've done massive public murals. I've had stuff exhibited in galleries and other places. My first uh, college degree was actually an associate's, and even before that, I was doing certifications in um, digital media and graphic design. So in my early 20s, I actually opened my own company where I was building websites. I I built my first website in 1999 and uh, I was building websites and doing graphic design and printing. Like I I would design business cards and postcards and brochures and and, and resell the printing to everything from, you know, mortgage brokers and real estate companies to restaurants to that kind of stuff. I was, you know, making menus, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I I did that for for many years. And uh, the sitting on a computer between going to that and the martial arts was killing me. Right. Mm. I spent 10, 12 hours in a chair working on a computer, destroying my back, destroying my body, and then go, you know, train like a semi-professional martial artist. And I was teaching professionally and working out of professional facilities. You know, I could train, you know, two to three hours a day. And it's just the, the contrast between the two, you know, the muscles get really weak sitting in the chair. They say sitting is actually the new smoking and Mm -hmm. kills your kidneys damages your lower back. I started having neck and back problems. I started having problems with my wrists, carpal tunnel, all this kind of stuff. And uh, that kind of led me to a career change to go and to pursue the, the acupuncture and integrative medicine full time. I'll, I'll tell you the story in a second. And then outside of that, I was in, in music as well. I've been organizing um, events and I started off with throwing um, raves and parties in high school in, in mm. the mid nineties. In 1998, I met a gentleman by the name of, uh, 97 actually, of uh, Speedy Legs. He's like the OG of Miami breakdancing. And okay. I've been organizing international uh, breakdancing and b-boy competitions since the 90s. We just had our 25th year anniversary. Actually, actually this year was our 26th. So uh, we've been organizing these breakdancing competitions for 26 years. I'm still involved. I'm on the board of a national nonprofit now called USA Breakin. Uh, I also don't have as much time as I'd like to devote for it, but you know, I kind of got uh, one foot in uh, one foot out, still trying to support it as much as possible and, and still trying to pursue my passions. DJing was a big part of my life as well. So I kind of bounced around, you know, between I was doing the art and, you know, I'd make a few bucks there doing it professionally. I'd make some, some cash on the side DJing, whether it be throwing our own events or weddings and corporate events I, and then I would, you know, I had the uh, the printing and the graphic design company, and and I did all that for a, a long time. And then I got really sick in my early mm. 30s. I, I got to the point where I was basically disabled uh, for about a year, and I was having hot flashes, chills, fatigue, severe depression. I had systemic joint pain every single joint, my entire body, um, elbows, knees, shoulders, you name it. Back and neck pain was so bad. I physically could not sit in a chair for more than five minutes. Mm-hmm. My carpal tunnel had gotten so bad. I couldn't even shake a hand. I could I could barely lift a, a glass of water. 
and uh, I was losing my grip strength and I'd wake up in the middle of the night with my hands burning and have to shake them out to get some sensation and feeling back in them. And it was just getting worse and worse. And I spent a whole year going from doctor to doctor to doctor just to have them tell, you know, do all their scans and all their blood work. And I saw endocrinologists and they did biopsies on my thyroid and I went to orthopedics and I was scheduled for carpal tunnel surgery two times with hand surgeons, never did it. Yes. I saw three different neurologists. And for the most part, what they just kept telling me is, oh, it's it's all in your head. Here's muscle relaxers. Here's pain pills, you know, go mm. home and, and, and die, basically, is kind of the message I took out of that. Mm. Um, you know, I think I tried one muscle relaxer and, you know, I messed around in high school and I kind of knew that wasn't going to end well. Mm. And I felt terrible and I couldn't for the life of me see like, OK, let's just say I take these muscle relaxers and pain pills. What happens a week from now? What happens two weeks from now? How do right. I get better? That, that doesn't get me better. Yeah. So I um I gave up on those and, and and finally I walked into a friend of mine's shop. He's got a vitamin and nutrition store for about 35, close to 40 years now. And he invents vitamins, a guy by the name of Reed Eckert from uh, Nutrition Direct. And we had been friends since high school and he knew me well. And I used to do his printing for him and we'd barter and stuff. And I walked in one day and the first thing he says to me, as soon as I walked through the door is you look like crap. Hmm. So I uh, I tell him the whole story. Uh -huh. And he tells me, I I'm going to get you better. No problem. You're fine. You're healthy. I know what's wrong with you. And I don't believe him because I'm like, dude, you sell vitamins. I've seen a dozen doctors. I've yeah. seen specialists. Like, what are you talking about? You know, but I had nothing to lose at that point. Right. And and he took good care of me and, and he put me on some uh, some nutrients and had me change my diet and, some, you know, um, a couple other things, some some lifestyle things. And within two weeks, it was like a miracle. All the hot flashes, all the chills, all the fatigue, and all the depression, gone. Just like that. That's and amazing. So it's probably, yeah. what, inflammation from some stuff, and then also your body was missing some nutrients, potentially? So it was a combination of many different things. He also put me with a chiropractor, and, and I was doing my acupuncture with my acupuncturist, Dr. George Love, and uh, Paul Grillo was the chiropractor I was seeing at the time. And within six to eight months, all the pain was gone. But it was... You know, I had tried to go vegan twice. That was extremely unhealthy for me. For some people that might save your life, for me, it was killing me. Mm -hmm. I was overtraining. I was training, you know, the martial arts by three plus hours a day uh, with no time to rest. I was sleeping probably three to four hours a night because I was mm -hmm. just so busy between running the business and, and training and everything else that I was into. I was sitting on a computer probably 12, 14 hours a day. So I think it was a combination of all those things, I'm yeah. having a lack of nutrients, trying to go vegan, um, overtraining, spending too much time on the computer. I was doing yoga, which all that was exacerbating the problems with my carpal tunnel, right? Being mm. having your hand in a hyperflex uh, position for an hour plus in a yoga class or doing upside down push-ups with your feet against the wall, right? So that was yeah. just hyperextending the wrists and, and causing further damage. And, you know, everybody's like, oh yoga is good for you. And it was just, it was making my back worse. It was, it was making everything worse. So I still, I've adapted the practice to my own, uh, you know, and, but everything for the most part is healed. You know, I, I know my limitations better now. I can still train. I, I don't have the time to, to train like that every day, mm. but for the most part, I, I've made a full recovery or, you know, 98% or so. So it was incredible. And it was disheartening to see that as a young healthy person in america with health insurance i can't get care like mm. it was it was unacceptable mm -hmm. and i and i had been studying acupuncture in the eastern medicine with um my doctor um dr love for about 10 12 years before that i was helping him with his seminars i was teaching classes for him and interning at his clinic and i was very interested and having after having lived through that whole experience i, I basically knew i couldn't go back to the same lifestyle Number one, and number two, I wanted to help other people in the same shoes. You know, mm, there's, that's beautiful. It's just, thank you. It, it's just crazy that nobody can point you in the right direction. Not one doctor could be like, see a nutritionist, right? Or do physical therapy, whatever it is. They were all just, you know, drugs and injections and they want to do cortisone shots and all these things. And I, I just, I knew better. I, I knew that wasn't going to help me. Unfortunately, most people are like, the doctor knows best. He's the mm. expert, right? And, and you know the uh, the training they have is, is sometimes defies common sense and logic, and they go straight for you know the pharmaceutical route and or surgical route and other things without kind of looking at the basics first, human basic human biology. Yeah, and this kind of goes back into it. Would sound like this is what really led you into integrated medicine, right? Which is 
how would you best describe it? They, all different parts of the body working together? Absolutely. And, and that's kind of how the root of the Eastern medicine traditions are. And I think probably most indigenous type of medicine, it's a, it's a holistic medicine where we consider a, exactly what you said, all the different systems, right? Your digestion, your sleep, your bowel movements. For women, there's cycles, right? Uh, hormones, diet, hydration, all these kinds of things are extremely important. The most important things for your health. And if any of those things are kind of out of whack or out of balance, you're not going to be healthy and that's going to turn in a bunch of symptoms. And if you don't look at it from that model, if you don't look at it through that lens, you're going to end up with the conventional allopathic medicine where just you have this symptom, you get this drug or this surgery. That's it without even considering any of the root causes. So to, to the root sum it up, yeah, it's, it's a root cause type of medicine. Right? Yep which is the same thing we do with functional medicine. And that's been well-documented from the traditional Chinese medicine. I mean, we have books literally that are 2000 years old talking mm. about this kind of stuff in specific case studies. So it's very well-documented. That's amazing. And then how would you, what would you consider like a good acupuncture practice? So like in my history, it's like, I've, I've enjoyed acupuncture. What I've noticed with acupuncture is that definitely who is giving it to you plays a, I mean, it's like this most stuff, right? But who is giving it to you plays a large factor in how much benefit you get from it. But if you could explain kind of briefly what the biggest benefits are, are of acupuncture, then like, what do you feel like a good practice of that is, would be? Yeah. And, and I love that you brought that up and you could kind of bring the, the, I guess the skills of the practitioner almost to like a surgeon, right? Like a general practitioner, uh, you know, or like a primary doctor. It's, yeah, you have this cold, you get this drug, you get this. But if you're having a surgeon, right, you want the best surgeon. You don't want the guy that just got out of school or doesn't have the experience doing the surgical procedure you want. So acupuncture is the same. So outside of the traditional Chinese medicine training that I've had here in the States, I've lived with the uh, Shaolin monks in Buddhist temples in China for months at a time. And I've studied in hospitals over there. And I've also been trained on orthopedic style acupuncture, which is very different than what most of the schools teach, right? That would be more like the dry needling type of acupuncture where we're working on specific muscles and tendons and stuff like that. As far as benefits, the easiest way to sum it up is it's, it's very simple. So let's, let's run this scenario. What happens if you cut yourself, Chase? If you get a cut on your arm? Uh, body bleeds from that area. And then, bingo. And then what happens? And then... What the body does, mm -hmm. the body the body works to heal itself. Exactly. So that's what we're doing with acupuncture. There's there's generally no bleeding, and long before acupuncture, right? It, the uh, common okay. medicine was actually bloodletting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then we realized, you know what? We don't need to bloodlet everybody because some people might be borderline anemic. There's more risk. There's more risk for infection when you're doing that kind of stuff. So the acupuncture needles today are very tiny but they're making mm -hmm. micro little wounds in the areas you want the body to repair itself. That's one method, right? So they go in and let's say you have a, a tendon that's sprained or strained or a muscle that's strained, right? And we could put needles directly in it or around it. And then your body's going to say, Hey, this doesn't belong here. So it's going to send fresh blood to the area, white blood cells, uh, right? Lymphocytes, cytokines, all sorts of growth factors. Your body's immune system is going to take over and try to heal that little hole that you just made in that area. And it's going to send fresh blood there. And as the fresh blood comes in, it's going to get rid of diseased and damaged tissue and cells and regenerate healthy new cells, right? When you bleed or when you have a hole in your tissue, you're creating clotting factor. And clotting factor actually has growth hormone in it. So mm. it's like you're tricking your body into making basically HGH in the areas that you want it to heal. And then on top of that, you're stimulating the local nervous system. So you're telling the brain hey, something's going on in this area and you're sending electrical right, and, and chemical signals back and forth to the brain, telling it to also go focus on this area because you're going to have sensations when you're feeling the needle go in there that your body is not used to. So you're sending the blood flow there, you're creating, a, you're stimulating a, your body's innate healing response. And then the third thing that they show a lot of times is they've done functional MRI studies that show that acupuncture actually releases endorphins Mm. Are opioids that your body makes on its own. So like serotonin, mm. dopamine, oxytocin. So they actually make you feel good. Sometimes you even get a little woozy or feel a little high after acupuncture, right? Or you just feel very relaxed and, and loose and, and they kill the pain. 
then there's a few different theories on how we, you know, we could block the signals going back and forth to the central nervous system. So if you have pain signals that are being sent from an area, putting the needles in could possibly interrupt. Um, that's called gate theory. Interrupt the signals going back to the spine and to the nervous system, which can help your brain kind of rewire and create some neuroplasticity. So you perceive the pain in a different way. So those are the physiological mechanisms, mm. you know, Thousands of years ago, we didn't have that language. So we just said, hey, you're moving blood and, and chi, which would just be energy in your body. It's just a scientific. It's just different language and kind of a different paradigm to kind of look at it. And then because the body is working to repair what it thinks is minor uh, damage, trauma to it, is there best practices in terms of what to do after acupuncture? Like would it not a good idea to train the rest of the day or so great great question it, it kind of depends right you definitely wouldn't want to have acupuncture and then run straight to the gym and start you know lifting heavy could you take a little break and then go do some exercise later in the day sure you probably wouldn't want to do it before you're going to play a, a competitive match or you know do something um, extremely physical because if some of the muscles are going to be too relaxed, right? Mm. They might be more prone to injury that way. So you kind of want to, it's typically used more after, right? Mm. To kind of mm. for recovery more than before. You might use it before for certain things. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to, and this comes back from the ancient traditions, you wouldn't want to get acupuncture and then go hop in a pool or a lake immediately after. You want to give the, the holes a little time to close up. I mean, they close immediately. You won't see any holes. There's no blood or anything like that. But generally, they look at it like that's the period where your body is a little bit vulnerable mm -hmm. to elements. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't want like to be out in the cold and the rain or something immediately after an acupuncture session. But other than that, you don't have any like specific, you know, major restrictions. You you can do everything. You just don't want to go uh, too hard and too heavy, on, you know, immediately thereafter. And then how did you end up working with the Shaolin monks? So I was about two, three thirds of the way through my master's program. And then I went and did a doctorate later on, but I, I wanted to go spend time training in China and in my school at the time, which was the Atlantic Institute of Oriental Medicine in Fort Lauderdale. It's been there about 30 years. They had a program where they were sending people to um, Beijing University of Chinese Medicine and Shanghai University. And it, it just didn't seem like exactly what I wanted. I wanted like more old school, traditional, you know, um, training in, in the medicine and being a martial artist, I wanted to do something like the heavily involved Kung Fu. I think for a lot of martial artists, you know, visiting the Shaolin temple is like our dream, right? Mm. We've seen the movies from, you know, a million different movies from Jet Li and Jackie Chan and everybody else that's on movies on Shaolin temple, right? Or grow up, listen to Wu Tang talking about them and all that kind of stuff. So I started reaching out to different schools in, in the area and most of them are just like, absolutely not. We teach Kung Fu. We don't have any time for any medicine. We're not interested in that. Like maybe you can go on the weekends and get a massage. And mm -hmm. that just wasn't great. And then I finally got to a school uh, where my Shifu, uh, Shifu uh, Yanjun was at. And he had his own academy within the Shaolin Temple Park National Grounds. Not in the city. Like he was actually walking distance from the temple in the national park that they had. There's only about a dozen academies and only a couple that teach foreigners. Mm -hmm. And he happened to be very close friends with the gentleman, the the head monk, who's like the number two at Shaolin Temple and runs the medical clinic. They have a medical clinic that's been there 1,500 years as well. And it's attached to the temple and, and they wow. have doctors there. And he kind of understood that specifically with Kung Fu, other martial arts as well, but very much with Kung Fu, traditional Kung Fu, the medicine is part of the martial arts. You really can't separate that from the martial arts. Things like bone setting and the poultices and the sprays and the topical lotions and all that kind of stuff and, and um, pressure points and, you know, which are a lot of times acupuncture points was always part of the traditional Kung Fu and the martial arts. So he understood that and he had been studying himself and luckily he had a um, somebody at the school, my, my friend Andy, that we became very close now, who spoke English. She was Romanian and my mother, my mom was actually born in Romania as well. And she lived in mm -hmm. England and in Greece and, she speaks uh, all these different languages and Chinese and uh, Mandarin. So she was able to communicate with me and it was the only school out of maybe a dozen or so that I tried there and at Wudong, uh, you know, basically Wu Tang mountain uh, that would actually 
make a program for us. So it, at first it was just for me. Mm -hmm. And then my, my now wife ended up coming and then I ended up bringing eight students from the school, many who had no Kung Fu training at all. And we went over there for about a month for the, the first time. And it was eight hours a day of rigorous Kung Fu training. So basically like you're training as a professional martial artist at that point, eight hours a day, hardcore. Uh, the Shaolin monks are actually known uh, internationally for having some of the most extreme and intense conditioning when it mm -hmm. comes to the martial arts. So uh, literally every day we'd wake up at 5 a.m. We would do about half an hour of meditation. Then at 5.30, we would go out and do about half an hour of Qigong. Then you would do half an hour of Tai Chi. Then you'd have breakfast, take a little break. Then you would train like intense for about three and a half, four hours. You would take a lunch break. On our lunch break every day, it was like a four hour break because it was just too hot outside to train in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. And we'd spend a few hours with one of the doctors from the temple. They would either bring one of the doctors to the academy or we would go down to the temple clinic and, and train with them on acupuncture and Tui Na, which is the um, Chinese massage or herbal medicine, meditation, Qigong, all those kinds of things. And then after lunch, then you would train again for another three plus hours. Then you'd have dinner. And then sometimes just to keep everything fresh in our mind, we would train a little bit after dinner, too. So we did that for about a month, and then the next year, I went and then back real quick, again. let me pause you on that. Yeah. Wait, so a place like that seems like it's very single-minded focus in terms of becoming the best martial artist you could be. What do you feel like their perspective is in terms of having the meditation, the Tai Chi, and the Qigong as part of a daily practice in terms of helping as a martial artist? That's a beautiful that you brought that up. Once again, some of the academies are probably not as strict on it i mean i'd be out there and you'd see like a kung fu master smoking cigarettes on the side right yeah. and, or drinking beers at night and sitting on a cell phone so that makes you kind of question like uh you know not only their integrity but like how serious are they about the lifestyle with my instructor specifically he was very much into the medicine aspect of it so he took it very seriously and the shaolin lifestyle it is not just about uh, the martial aspect of it right because you know it's a buddhist temple so mm. they are supposed to and live by uh, buddhist and Taoist guidelines which is supposed to be a very simple life and uh, part of the reason they do the meditation and the tai chi and the qigong in the morning not only to keep the mind clear but you want these uh, warm-up exercises to kind of protect the body and to prepare the body for the hard physical labor you're going to be doing afterwards for the rest of the day so at the academy I was with, they were very, very serious about doing the uh, the meditation and the Tai Chi and the Qigong every morning. And, and it is protective. And the Qigong is actually what drew me into the Eastern medicine initially. When I had met my instructor over here, I started practicing uh, the Qigong daily. And you can feel profound changes in the body happening quickly. And for those mm -hmm. that are not familiar with it, it, it looks like Tai Chi. But Tai Chi is actually a martial art. Every single movement in Tai Chi has martial purposes. It is for mm -hmm. fighting, although it's not always taught that way. But uh, Qigong is strictly just for health. So it's almost like the Chinese version of yoga, except it's much easier because it's all performed standing for mm -hmm. the most part. You can do it sitting. So there's no crazy weird poses. It's a combination of uh, breath work and movements with visualizations so that's what makes it a little different from the yoga you're actually focused on the awareness of chi flow and blood flow and what's going on in the body and you actually use your mind when we say the yi guides the chi so you're using your intention and your intent and your your will to guide energy to do certain things to clear certain channels so it is very medical depending on how you practice there's people who teach it uh, they go very in-depth into exact visualizations and things like that and there's some uh, places that just teach you, like, listen, just do it again and again and again and keep your mind completely clear and just, you know, see what you feel and, and see what happens. So it's um, it's a crucial part. And going back to what you brought up earlier about the um, how good and how skilled the practitioner is, I think that's a big part of it, right? If you mm -hmm. go to a doctor or an acupuncturist and they're 300 pounds, right? And they smell like cigarettes or, you know, you see a McDonald's wrapper on their desk, like they're not even taking care of themselves. How good are they going to be, right? How good are your energy? And from the Eastern medicine, we, we were transmitting energy. It's kind of like Reiki, but except mm -hmm. Reiki is without intention. You just transmit the energy. But even through the acupuncture needle, 
we have an intention when I'm needling somebody. Yes, there's all those physiological things that we talked about, but I'm also using my E to guide the chi to say, okay, I want this point to have this function or action on you. Besides just sending some blood flow and fixing a problem, uh, the different points have various different functions that have to do with internal medicine and things within the meridians and the channel system, which is probably way too complicated to get into on a short podcast. And then you, I'm guessing the shallow monks, would you consider them, be, are they overtrained? Overtrained is so... It, Ooh. Or not. I, mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm I these, yeah, maybe. Um, they, they do. They start them real young and they train them real hard. However, because they have such a clean lifestyle for the most part, because they're do meditating every day, because they're doing Qigong and Tai Chi every day, because they eat super, super clean, right? And because they are getting a good night's sleep, they don't have, you know, they're not playing video games in the middle of the night. They're actually getting sleep. They, they do recover pretty well. So Body while, yeah, while most of us probably wouldn't have that ability to recover and have these, you know, crazy stressful lives, I think uh, they've managed to work their system for the last, you know, 1500 years where it works for them and, mm -hmm. and they do pretty well. And it's funny you bring that up. I was, when I was there the first time and I was talking to my chief and I was to explain to him, I was like, listen, there's a lot of these things I can't do because I have injuries from years of training martial arts and, and where I was at for many years, it was it was basically like Fight Club. We'd have people coming into the dojo from other dojos, but it was like we heard you guys like to fight, and we would just take open challenges. Like it wasn't like, sure, no problem. Like anybody could walk in and be like, we yeah. want to fight, and you could go through, you know, the whole team. We'd be happy to take them on. Um, and and my shifu basically, and it was through a translator, but he basically just said, "You're training wrong." Mm -hmm. And then I was like, "Oh man, wow, I think he's right." <laughs> You know, so uh, I think I, I wasn't, you know, very simply, he was able to kind of just break that down in, you know, very uh, monk like fashion. And it made me kind of go back and think about it and be like, yeah, I'm not allowing myself to recover. I'm not. And at the time, I probably wasn't doing the additional strength training or rehabilitation that I needed to 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 fix injuries. I would just like most guys, right, just keep training and training and training and just kind of push through whatever injuries we had. And then. What is for the, you said they start young, which I've seen before over there, like in going to the temple, like what is the age that they usually go in? And then what do you, what is the, how do they get there? Like, is it mom and dad saying this is the best path for you? Yeah. It's, okay. You know, uh, for, you know, multiple of different reasons. So, you know, they're, they're either at the temple or at a different academy or Deng Feng, which is the city uh, next to uh, the Shaolin temple is got a massive they, I mean, they have schools with thousands and thousands of students. So, like, my instructor was actually dropped off by his parents at 11 years old, and he was overweight and got bullied, and and then he ended up living like inside the actual temple, not an academy, like at at the temple from 11 to 18, 19, toured the world with them, and then started uh, working in other academies, and eventually opened his own academy. And now he's kind of been moving around and helping set up Shaolin temples in, in different locations. And does Israel have anything like this? And the context of the question is like, do you feel like it doesn't, it's not, of course, Kung Fu or something, but do you feel like there'd be benefit to have that as a, like a viable option, in, you know, in the United States or in Israel or in other countries in terms of a pathway over there? So, yeah, it, it's fun. You know, um, there is traditional Kung Fu in Israel. They don't have probably like a Shaolin temple, but they have, they do teach Shaolin Kung Fu in Israel. Uh, I think most people in Israel are more focused on sports, kind of like judo is huge mm -hmm. in Israel, um, karate is huge in Israel, um, Krav Maga is obviously huge in Israel for practicality of mm -hmm. purpose and being that it was kind of a Israeli invention, if you will, right, based mm -hmm. on other arts. Uh, in the States, the U.S. is the same thing. We actually do have a good amount of traditional Kung Fu and we do have some official Shaolin Temple partners in the United States, uh, one in New York, there's some on the West Coast, and there's uh, a lot of schools that teach um, Shaolin in the United States. I think, though, traditional Kung Fu is very difficult in the U.S. More, most people are, are more focused on the sport aspect of it. So mm. more people recently, you know, they go more towards MMA where they can compete and you know, look at for a career or think it's just, you know, more effective uh, for fighting, which a lot of times it is because you're going to spend more time on, on practical stuff rather mm. than just 
overall health and wellness and, you know, uh, mind balance and that kind of stuff. And then like, you know, Taekwondo, right. You can go to the Olympics, right. You can compete every single weekend. So I think young folks kind of go more to that. And also the belts, right. Like in Mm -hmm. China and Japan, they they don't have belts, right. There's like (laughs) one color for the school in China and in Japan, like there's be like, you know, white belt, black belt, like that's it. So that's kind of like an American invention just to keep kids motivated and to make more money for the schools. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to run a uh, very traditional martial arts school like that here in the States without being super sport orientated. And, and then I actually you- organized a couple of Kung Fu competitions here in 2018 and 2019. I threw some Kung Fu and uh, integrated medicine health fairs here, one in Coconut Creek and one in Coral Springs. And then we had COVID start and, and I had the kids and kind of mm. taking a break from that now. And then when you got, I guess, what was your biggest takeaway from there? Then where did, how, what did you do when you got back? You know, I got back the first year, had another um, year of school left in my master's. And then I came back again the next year with just uh, my wife and, and one of my very close friends, who is another one of my classmates uh, and uh, another practitioner. And then we spent six weeks there the next year. And we spent another five weeks with the monks. And then we spent a week in Beijing working out of hospitals and um, different private clinics and seeing how they kind of practice firsthand. Um, I, you know, I brought a lot of those skills back. So it's very Mm -hmm. different than the way they practice in the U S there's pros and cons. They tend to be a lot rougher and have a lot less bedside manner uh, Mm -hmm. over there. That it's just Mm -hmm. not a concern. It's kind of more like how a surgeon operates. Like they're just like very cut and dry and um, they're not worried about your comfort level, right? We're Mm -hmm. here we think of acupuncture almost like yes for sports, but we also think of it as kind of like a spa experience. Mm. Right. So it's, um, I've been able to kind of meet in the middle in the both worlds. And I've been able to utilize some of the things we were taught from the monks as far as meditation and kind of like hypnosis type of practices and, uh, the Qigong stuff and incorporate that into my practice and, and teacher treats actually just came back. Uh, two weeks ago, I was up in Boston teaching Qigong and breath work to faculty from Harvard and Yale and um, Sloan Kettering um, Cancer Center and University mm. of Massachusetts. So oh, I am using those types of skills. I've taught at a lot of the universities. I speak at a lot of conferences locally on everything from trauma to mental health to the psychedelics and the mental health aspect of all that. So I, I've definitely incorporated a lot of it into my practice. And it has made an impact, I think, on myself and my patients. And I try to tell some of the stories that the monks told and kind of share that that wisdom and, and, and that lifestyle with people who are open and willing, right? Not everybody wants it. Some people are coming in and they're like, listen, I don't care about any of that. Just fix my knee. Yes. Right? Or just or just don't talk. I want to sleep through the session, you know? So yeah. you, you got to meet the patients in the middle. But I think it was nice to see because it's definitely different. Than, than how we practice here and they have a much uh, greater scope of practice and they use different tools and and techniques over there so it was a, a good addition i think to my skill set and then do you have any recommendations for someone who maybe wants to check out qigong in terms of like good online resources like instructional videos or specific teachers online yeah i would say um reach out to us like find at me on um, instagram and then i could kind of gauge what exactly they're looking for and figure out like what bet uh would be best for them uh the one i use a lot is you know um my instructor is uh dr george love or i think it's a um, uh chi or you know i i'll if they reach out to me i could kind of point them depending on their goals and depending on their mindset uh you know my instructor now is doing more stuff with like music and it's more fun and if somebody wants more like very traditional i could point them in the way like if one of the, like the chinese teachers that teaches it like that style if they want one that's like super medical i could point them to a teacher that kind of works that way and in the future i'll be rolling out my own online thing i've just been so busy with the clinic and the kids and teaching at events and speaking in events and doing these podcasts i haven't gotten around to yeah i'll put my whole online thing out yet that's awesome and then how did you get into the herbs medicine was you know it was always something i was interested in and when i had my experience with my health issues you know everything we kind of fixed was without pharmaceuticals was all more vitamins and supplements but some herbal stuff too and then as i started in my master's program for eastern medicine we actually had to become board certified herbalists as well so Mm. i did three years of my master programs another two years of my doctorate plus all the studying in china and uh 
it's incredible. So that's our internal medicine where the acupuncture is going to be acupuncture can be used for some internal stuff, mm. but typically if it's a deep rooted condition, you're going to need something else. So, you know, we have different deficiencies and herbs have different medicinal properties and some people may not realize this, but almost every drug and pharmaceutical compound is actually extracted from some kind of herbal compound, right? Mm. Everything from aspirin came from white willow to digioxin and foxglove root to we see everything now with, you know, uh, medical cannabis and CBD. Um, these are all things that we've been used since the beginning of time and, and they've been very effective. And the, the Chinese and the Egyptians were the first ones to really document that kind of stuff. Mm. and have the first books on herbology going back thousands of years. So these practices are very well developed. There's been a lot of research on them. That is essentially the scientific method, right? You just keep reproducing the experiment over and over again. In this case, on billions of people over thousands of years. So we know it works, whether or not every single thing has these double blind, placebo, randomized clinical trials. Obviously, it's it's very difficult for somebody to invest a billion dollars in, a, in or hundreds of millions of dollars in a trial when there's nothing they could patent or, or make out of it. So I've seen miracles with herbs and I've treated both with the herbs and the acupuncture and the functional medicine. I, I mean, we've reversed autoimmune diseases, um, severe digestive issues, everything from Crohn's and colitis to mixed connective tissue diseases to long COVID to all sorts of things that we're kind of uh, working with that um to a lot of gynecological issues women's health is one of our specialties everything mm -hmm. from fertility to PCOS, pcos and endometriosis where i've seen absolute miracles with just herbs alone sometimes just acupuncture or the combination how i practice which is like the functional medicine some uh nutrient supplements plus a combination of herbs and acupuncture and some of these other holistic modalities as needed per patient and depending on the how comfortable the patient is with the, the treatment or that, you know, what you're laying out for them. And in terms of herbs and like bioavailability, do you prefer tincture, tinctures, excuse me, tinctures, or, you know, boiling, boiling herbs in water, or what do you usually recommend? So the, I, I think the traditional way is the best. However, most patients don't have the, the time or the, um, where we're allowed to sit there and, and boil herbs for half an hour, an hour and stink up the whole house nor do I have the time to sit there and individually sort the individual herbs. It's extremely time consuming. I have mm. great respect for people to do. And I still do sometimes for certain patients if nothing else has been working for them or for myself and for the kids. Um, I think it's blurred out, but I have a whole herbal pharmacy behind me here at home. Uh, for the most part in the clinic, we use either granules where it's concentrated extracts, like a powder that you can make mm. it in a tea. You just put like a teaspoon in some boiling water and mix it up and you can shoot it right back. It's actually uh, pretty strong that way. It's, it's concentrated. So it's an excellent delivery mechanism. And you get the taste and the flavor of the herb with that, which is part of the medicine of the Eastern tradition. You can't actually, you want the flavor and the taste, whether it's bitter or sour or sweet, whatever it is, that helps the, the medicine. Now, for the people who can't do that, we have patent pills. I like the, the powders because I can custom mix. I can say, okay, you need, you know, 50% of this and 20% of this and 10% of this. We're going to mix these three formulas and then we're going to throw in a little bit of this individual herb, which fits specifically to your unique case. If they don't want to do that, then we'll get the closest pill to, you know, a traditional formula that maybe has been around for 1200 years. And we'll say, okay, this fits your body type, your constitution and some of your symptoms. So this should work for you. So it's a, it's a combination of those. I do use tinctures sometimes. Uh, tinctures mostly for kids or for people who have issues that um you know if there's they have that problem swallowing pills or tea or something like that and the tinctures are extremely effective and i have some friends and colleagues that swear by them and only use them mm -hmm. it's just not my personal preference but uh, for me i think you know anything that works that they all work pretty well the least effective are the little tea pills they have these little black uh, tea pills that they make those are not very effective. Uh, the capsules, I think, are, are effective. Um, and tinctures and the granules are probably the best if, if you can't do the raw herbs. And then for those that are healthy and just looking to increase performance, do you would you recommend taking herbs daily, like having a daily practice? So interesting you brought that up. We are typically taught not to take any medicine you don't need. 
Mm. Right now, not that because even though it's herbs and it's all natural, there still may be some side effects or there still may be, be some contraindications. Uh, that being said, it doesn't mean that we don't recommend it, but from the herbal perspective and the way we're taught in Eastern medicine, you don't take things like that without a professional to kind of guide you through it. Because mm. let's say you and I both have insomnia mm. and let's say you're, you know, the dry thin type, right? And I'm, large and always mucousy and phlegmy the formula that you take is going to be vastly different from the formula that i take mm. and if you t and if you take my formula it might actually make you worse if i give you a drying formula that's going to make your skin and your mouth and your eyes even more dry and start to dry up your body fluids and your blood supply that could be a problem right and if you and if i take a formula that was meant for you that's going to increase my body fluids but i'm already producing too much phlegm and mucus or too much body fluids it's going to make me worse. So mm -hmm. uh, there are herbs that we use for performance, but it's best to kind of work with a professional to figure out what's right for you. Now, some herbs might be more safe than mm -hmm. others, right? Like maybe a little tangerine peel or astragalus or something like that. But if you're getting into like red ginseng or things like that, that could actually be dangerous and contraindicated for certain conditions. So you mm -hmm. might think you're going to give yourself more energy, but you might actually be bringing yourself closer to like an adrenal burnout by doing the wrong thing like that. That's awesome. And then what would you say with maybe a couple all natural methods to, or not all natural, but something outside of like herbs to help with, I'm looking like from a athletic perspective where we cover where adrenal is a big issue potentially. Yeah. And then also, uh, well, actually let's just go there. So would you, what would you recommend in terms of some things that people can do who are high energy, high performing, high, highly active that could help, you know, lower, be able for them to recover fully the next day? Yeah. So, so first, I mean, I think it's always great to work with a specialist, a performance mm -hmm. specialist, whether it be in, in all these things, right? You're going to want a physio guy or somebody that does functional training. You're going to want a nutritionist. Um, on the herbal perspective, I'd recommend working with somebody that knows what they're doing. From a nutrient perspective, it's, it's, I think that's pretty easy. I mean, most people could benefit from the basic stuff like the fat-soluble vitamins, right? Um, a, D, uh, E, K, and minerals, right? A lot mm. of us are mineral deficient in our daily diets just because the soil is not the same and the food is not the same as what our grandparents and great grandparents were eating. So while we may have been able to get all those nutrients from food before, it's really difficult now um, I think most of us, um, unless you're, you know, in a bodybuilding or something like that, most of us have trouble getting the inadequate amount of protein as well. So I think mm. just having a, a good diet, uh, a good hydration schedule. And here's the other thing. If you're sweating a lot and you're hydrating a lot, you're shedding even more vitamins and minerals. So you will need to replace them. So uh, I think some of the basics, you know, and once again, it kind of varies, but a good quality multivitamin that doesn't have any, you know, synthetics or fillers or the artificial colorings or that kind of stuff in there. Um, a mineral supplement, electrolytes and uh, omegas and some of the fat soluble vitamins are the basics, right? And mm -hmm. then, you know, depending on the person, you might want, you know, um, maybe some CoQ10 or, or some other nutrients to kind of help um, just kind of power the body and help with some of the recovery um, you know, joint issues, you know, like glucosamine and some of those kind of things, you know, the MSM chondroitin, could be helpful. Uh, once again, you want to find good brands. So most of the big box shelf stuff is actually fake or not helpful at all. And a lot mm -hmm. of times can be toxic. So I'd always recommend either seeing a specialist for that as well, or going to like a health food store or dealing with a doctor that can get you like nutraceutical grade or medical grade stuff. The New York DA did a study a few years back where they actually pulled 20 random vitamins, even from big box stores. Sometimes I think some of them might've even been like Whole Foods, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens. And they picked 20 of the most popular uh, vitamins and nutrients mm -hmm. and like St. John's Wort, magnesium and everything. And they found out that the majority of them contained little to none of the ingredients that they are actually saying were in there. Interesting. So, which That's is crazy. why some doctors will be like, oh, don't take vitamins. They don't work. They're fake. They're not bioavailable. They got some credibility there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for the most part, they're wrong and they don't right. know what they're talking about because they haven't studied it, but they've seen a headline or two about something like that. And mm -hmm. then they just assume it's all the same. Uh, but the fact is they don't, they're not educated about that in school 
And most doctors, once they get out of med school, uh, prefer to do very little reading after mm -hmm. all the schooling that they've done. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and they get most of their information from pharmaceutical sales reps. That's just mm -hmm. how it is. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, they're not always right when it comes to that kind of stuff. That's why I said so it's best to see a, like a functional medicine doctor, somebody like myself or a holistic nutritionist or, or something, you know, that could kind of help get you in a right, especially if you're a serious athlete. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for weekend warriors, I think like some of the stuff that I mentioned is fine. But if you have the means to do it, uh, you know, even us as provide, even as like, let's say a psychologist, like they get therapy from, from somebody else. You always want a third party that is a, a pro at that. And sometimes you might even want a second or third opinion on that because they don't always make the best decisions. Or like you mm -hmm. said, the acupuncture, you might not get the best person right off the bat. So I think the thing is, is uh, don't give up and don't assume one practitioner that they're all alike. If you don't like one massage, go to a different massage service. You don't like one gym, go to a different gym, right? Uh, so I think that's important to keep in mind. And then do you guys do anything with stem cells? The, the stem cells is a very interesting field. I was actually trained by an orthopedic that was uh, did surgery for about 30 plus years. And then he gave it up about 18 years ago to only focus on stem cells. And I've done training at a few different uh, stem cell facilities uh, since then. We do PRP. We do stem cells. The type of stem cells we use are only um, autologous stem cells, meaning they're derived from your own blood. Because the FDA specifically warns against using other people's stem cells while they're mostly safe that's why a lot of those procedures are done overseas like in mexico or colombia or wherever else uh because the fda frowns against it and there have been rare cases but it has happened where people have grown tumors or their organs have shut down and failed so the way i was trained is extraction of your own stem cells whether it be prp or mesenchymal stem cells and um uh, other stem cells, uh, hematopoietic stem cells from either like uh, bone marrow or fat cells and things like that. And now exosomes is the, is the new field that's kind of growing. Um, and we're seeing a lot of success with that kind of stuff. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting field. Once again, there's, there's not a lot of um, high quality research on it because if it's derived from your own blood or your own tissue, nobody's going to spend a billion dollars to patent that kind of mm. stuff. So we haven't seen large scale clinical trials on it. So I know a lot of people are working to try to get some of these products FDA approved and try to get insurance reimbursement from a case study perspective or just from um, a clinical perspective. I've, I've seen great success from uh, not only in my own clinic, but from some of our partners and some of my teachers. Uh, and we, and, you know, and we do a lot of it with, um, professional athletes to just people who want to basically put off a joint replacement for a while or something like that. You know, they don't know, they're not always ready to do the joint replacement or they have, you know, um, tendonitis, you know, uh, golfer's elbow or tennis elbow or something like that. Uh, I do a lot of shoulders, a lot of knees, a lot of hips, stuff like that. When it comes down to doing like uh, spine, I kind of refer them out to somebody who's got, you know, um, fluoroscope and some news, you know, like a surgeon to do something, you know, that in depth. And then we have some IV procedures too, where we basically mm. use, um, once again, just your own stem cells and we kind of process them in different ways with um, photonic light chambers and ultrasonic uh, cleaners to kind of shake them up. And we put them in hypoxic and hypothermic uh, environments where it creates very small embryonic like stem cells. So they're adult pluripotent cells, which basically have some of the same properties as, um, uh, embryonic cells or mm -hmm. umbilical cord cells but they're derived from your own tissue and then they go in the body and they kind of just seek out where you have damage or issues and they help kind of repair it but it's it, it's a emerging field it's super super interesting uh, unfortunately it's, it's expensive the technology and the expertise mm -hmm. is expensive and there isn't really any insurance reimbursement for that kind of things now so um, i'm a big proponent and i'm looking forward to watching that develop uh, throughout my career and then in terms of your opinion with using your own blood, how would you compare the benefits of that to what they're doing in other parts of the world and using the placenta and the umbilical cord? Uh, depends on your blood, right? So uh, yeah, for exactly. us, we're probably going to have better quality stem cells than somebody who's 68 years old and smoked and drank their whole life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I would say the umbilical cords and the embryonic stuff probably is more potent. However, there's more risks, right? Because let's say you injecting yourself with somebody else's DNA, 
and you don't know what kind of flaws they might have or, um, you know, familial genes or kind of hereditary stuff that may manifest itself as yours. Or just like if you have an organ transplant, right? Like you, your body might reject somebody else's cells. So mm. uh, pros and cons. I, I think it, it's, you know, the, the stuff they're doing overseas is interesting. And there's a lot of people doing gray area stuff within the country as well. Mm. And they're just kind of waiting for their warning letter, letters from the FDA or, you know, going from there. But it, it just, it, it it varies. Uh, you know, I like some of the stuff. I like the exosome stuff that's kind of coming out right now. But there's a lot that could be done from your own cells that I've seen miracles with the bone marrow and the fat cells and, and PRP. And the way I was trained, sometimes for extreme cases, you'd mix all three together. You'd actually extract bone marrow, you'd extract fat cells, and you would do PRP and do all three of those and inject all three of those into a joint or an area that, that has pain. So you, we've seen very good uh, success with those kinds of things. That's amazing. And then if you could share quickly kind of what your, you've already kind of gone through a gauntlet of all the amazing stuff your clinic offers, but what kind of the status is of the clinic that you run and then, um, yeah, kind of the different services you offer and how it all falls under this integrated medicine umbrella in terms yeah, of how people optimize Absolutely, I appreciate products. it. So I have a clinic in the Coral Springs area. We've been open there for about six years where we do mostly acupuncture and functional medicine where we work with people where we read their labs, we get them the right nutrients and supplements. We do their PRP shots and uh, you know some of the stem cells there. We do vitamin IVs, the vitamin drips. We have a medical massage therapist as well. And we have a full uh, vitamin shop. And outside of that, my brother and I have a clinic together, uh, Create Health. It's CR8 Health. And we've been in Boca for about a year. We just had our grand, our one year anniversary, uh, five days ago and Congratulations. it's grown fast. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And we do, my brother's a medical doctor. He's, he's actually a DO, but internal medicine, and he's also board certified in obesity medicine. So mm. a lot of what we're doing there is the medical weight loss, like the Ozempic and, uh, Manjaro now and all that kind of stuff. We do hormone replacement therapy there. So testosterone and then, uh, the pellets we do uh, aesthetics as well. We have a PA that specializes in aesthetics where they do Actually, I got a quick question on the yep. the TRT with the, the, the testosterone. It makes sense uh, is that the body stops producing it because it's getting, it's recognizing that there's a source coming in. But with some of these herbs that have been known, um, proven to do that, would it be helpful to take those as well or while doing the trt just to have that going into your body as a potential i don't know just this idea of the body stopping to produce testosterone is just it, it just i don't know it just i'm wondering if there's a better way to do things or so it's it's a case by case thing again right so you have um the people who are just like no i'll just do the testosterone and you got the people who are like they want to do it naturally and a lot of the herbs and, and things do work so there are um um a lot of things that do work naturally that will raise your testosterone. Sometimes it may not be enough. I had a 22 year old in the office that I'll be seeing again Thursday. His testosterone is down to like 240 something, which is mm -hmm. strange, right? Like traditionally you wouldn't see people that age that, are that low at that point, you know, the natural stuff might not be enough. Could you do both? Certainly for um, some people, if you were to do both, even if you're doing just one, as long as you're testing your levels on your regular basis, you kind of mm. want to make sure they're not through the roof. And if they are, you can just lower your dosage on the medication a little bit. I'm not a big fan of doing it unless you really have an issue. So I've, um, I've treated patients that are like professional fighters and basically, and, and their uh, justification for it was like, you know, getting hit in the head so many times messes up the, the pituitary and hormone production, and then you're not producing it the same. Mm. So if you have a legitimate concern, or, you know, if you're generally in your late 30s, 40s and slipping and you just want it for more, you know, muscle enhancement, libido, energy and all these things, it is very safe overall. You know, the, the, you know, you don't really see issues with it. So I, I'm not totally against it, but I always feel like going back to the integrative stuff, you should look at every single possible aspect first. What could be disrupting your hormones? Is it mm -hmm. microplastics? Is it something we're eating? Is it something we're drinking? Is it um, your hygiene products, right? Your shampoo or other thing that might have some kind of chemicals that are disrupting it? Is it just because you're you're lazy and you're not exercising, right? And, and, and do you need it? How low are your levels really? Because 
yeah, I don't want to shut off my natural testosterone production, mm. right? But in my case, it's good. So I haven't needed it. Uh, would I like to boost my performance? I'm sure, but I haven't got there yet and my levels are great. So I haven't gone for it. If your levels are slipping and you do need the performance and you do need the energy, uh, I think it's fine. I'm, I'm totally all for it. And, and yeah, and, and I would probably try the natural stuff first to go back mm -hmm. to what you were saying. I would try all the herbs and the natural methods to kind of boost it up first. And if I'm still not getting the results I want and I'm still not hitting the, the levels I want or don't feel how I'd like to feel, then I'd consider going on the testosterone. Replacement. That's awesome. Cool. And where can people find you online? So uh, <laughs> the, the best way to find me is um, you could look up uh, CR8 Health. So the letter C, the letter R, and the number 8 health.com or uh, integrativemedicine.us. I would say just find me on Instagram or Facebook at Jonathan M. Fields. So it's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. M as in Matthew Fields. If you, they find me there. They can find access to all my clinics, all the different things. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We do free consultations if anybody's got any questions or anything like that. But I uh, very much appreciate your time. I, I enjoy this. I think we, we've got into some interesting topics. And I'll be happy to share it and spread it. I'm looking forward to hearing more of your podcast as well. Cool. I appreciate you, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, brother. Have a wonderful day, and uh, we'll talk soon.